Welcome to class number four of this course in Law and Finance. Let's take a look at the program. Now, in the first part, which is the subject of this video, I'm first going to talk to you about exchange rate management. How do countries manage their exchange rates? And in the second part, we're looking at the institution responsible for exchange rate management in the post-war era. That is the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the entire legal framework of financial institutions that emerged after the Second World War. So let's get started. What's the purpose of exchange rate management? The exchange rate determines an economy's competitive position on international markets. What does that mean? If a country sells a lot of goods or services to other countries, its currency is in high demand. If a country sells less goods and services from another jurisdiction than it imports, its currency will not be of in high demand. That means that the exchange rate reflects the economic relationship between different countries, imports, exports, the current account, as one says. The current account is a technical term that signifies the relationship, the, the balance between imports and exports between two jurisdictions or between one jurisdiction against the rest of the globe. Now, central banks can influence or, if they want, manipulate the exchange rate. How does that take place? They can buy or sell foreign currency. And if you buy and sell foreign currency, you're lowering or increasing the price of your own currency. Why is that possible? Well, a central bank can create their own currency. Yeah, so by creating their own currency and selling or buying it against other currencies, they can ultimately influence the exchange rate. A second way for central banks to influence the exchange rate is by creating inflation artificially. You're lowering the value of your domestic currency by just printing money, basically, yeah? in excess of what is needed or what is required from a, a growth perspective. And that makes your country less popular internationally. So you're lowering the exchange rate. It is for these reasons that since the 19th century, there have been many attempts to stabilize exchange rates. I can't go through all the steps of this process here, but it's a, there has been a sustained effort at doing that. And last time in the last video, when I spoke to you about the Great Depression, you will remember that there was a gold standard. That was basically a way of exchange rate management by tying each currency to the gold standard. It was actually a fixed exchange rate. If each currency is tied to a specified amount of gold, exchange rates will be stable. However, you also heard in the last video that this gold standard had fatal effects because once you stabilize the exchange rate, you lose an important safety valve for your economy. If your own economic progress or growth is not so phenomenal, you'll still have a very high-priced currency that keeps its price. You, it, it doesn't fall. And that led to an enormous amount of problems during the Great Depression. It was a way by which countries, especially in Europe, imported deflation from the United States. And the same can happen for inflation. You can also import inflation if you tie your currency to another inflationary currency. So it's a system that goes with many risks. Now at this point, let's take a look at different ways of managing the exchange rate. The first type of exchange rate management is the fixed exchange rate. That basically corresponds to the gold standard that I just explained. Normally there's a lead currency or a gold that requires central banks to adjust to. So that means central banks have to intervene, they have to make purchases or sales of their own currency in order to, to fix it to the lead currency. 
The second kind of exchange rate management is the so-called packed float. That means that in principle, there is a fixed exchange rate, but you're allowing your currency to deviate from it within a certain horizontal band. So that means that you're only intervening once your currency falls below or, or comes above that fixed band. The third kind of exchange rate management is even more flexible. It works like the second, with the only difference that there is a peg that can be adjusted. So that means that from time to time, you're changing the band. You can push it up a little bit or lower it, depending on the overall development of your current account. The fourth type of exchange rate management is the so-called managed float or dirty float. In principle, you don't really have any commitment to a specific rate or a specific band or a peg or a specific band, but central banks intervene as they like. It's a discretionary system. And the last type of exchange rate management is basically do nothing. Just let the market adjust your exchange rate. The rate depends on your trade balance, on your current account. If you've got a deficit, your currency depreciates, it gets lower. If you've got a surplus in your current account, your currency appreciates, it gets higher. Here's a slide that shows you a packed float. It's actually historical data. It's, uh, it shows what happened when Great Britain joined the ERM, the European Exchange Rate Management. And you can see that before they joined, there, were, there was quite a high degree of volatility of the pound against the Deutsche Mark, which was the lead co currency for continental Europe at the time. And once they joined the system, they had to adjust the rate of the British pound within this peg marked by the two red lines. And that required quite a number of interventions from the central banks. And they left that in a crisis. They left this ERM in a crisis on the so-called Black Wednesday, when it just turned out that it wasn't a viable system any longer. At that time, the German bank, central bank, the Bundesbank, which then at that time was not part of the euro system yet, had a policy of very high interest rates. And that was at the beginning of the 1990s. Now you might wonder why that was the case. Think about it. But well, at the beginning of the 1990s, Germany was in high sovereign debt as a consequence of the German reunification without high interest rates. Germany would have seen spiking inflation rates just because the government needed so much money and because the government and because the government put so much so many bonds on the market, which means there was so much money available. Followers of Modern monetary theory, that is actually evidence that it's not just the central bank, but also the treasury, which influences the quantity of money. But that's just a side note. It's totally fine to understand the scenario in classical terms. Accordingly, German reunification came with an enormous growth in credit. And whether that credit is given to the state in the form of public debt or to private investors, doesn't really matter. There was just an enormous growth of the monetary base. And to keep that at bay in a phase that wasn't really characterized by economic growth, the Bundesbank had to impose very high interest rates. Due to the ERM, due to the European exchange rate management system, that had as a consequence that High interest rates were also required from countries like Great Britain. And that was not the policy needed for Great Britain at the time, because Great Britain was also in a recession and it needed low interest rates to enable investments. And for that reason, it left the ERM on Black Wednesday in 1992. And you see that its rate collapsed against the mark at that point.
So that shows really the vices and virtues of exchange rate management. On the one hand, it allows for stable economic relationships. The exchange rate doesn't pose a risk if you want to do transactions. And it reduces or eliminates the risk of currency manipulations, countries wanting to get an unfair advantage over others by you know, buying or selling their currency. On the other hand, it cannot really work unless you adjust business cycles. That means unless you've got fairly parallel boom periods and recessionary periods. If you don't have that, at some point, things develop in different directions and then one side wins enormously from this, from this exchange management while the other side loses. By the way, this is exactly what happened in the Eurozone crisis. We'll see that later in class number eight. Now let's take a look at the system of exchange rate management put in place after the Second World War. You see the two gentlemen here who played crucial roles. Do you recognize them? Well, the one on the right is more well known. That's John Maynard Keynes. And on the left is Harry White, the American head of delegation at the Bretton Woods Conference, which came up with this idea. What's the background? The Bretton Woods system was established as against two experiences. First, the Great Depression, the experience of deflation, capital flight, and protectionism. They thought that they couldn't go back to the gold standard like nothing had happened. And the second experience was the war and the state of war economies. They needed financial conditions that were stable to allow for the necessary economic recovery. And it's these two experiences that really framed the objectives of the Bretton Woods system. On the one hand, it should guarantee stable exchange rates to prevent currency manipulations, support business, and provide a stable foundation for growth. On the other hand, they wanted to avoid the destructive potential of the gold standard. So they knew that they would have to set up a more flexible system involving some safety valves. Now let's look at the institutions they came up with. The most important one from a currency perspective is certainly the International Monetary Fund, which provides for a system of stable but adjustable exchange rates. It's a system of adjustable pegs. We'll take a look at that in a second. Moreover, it also provides for a fund. If a country needs to adjust its currency, but cannot do so because it doesn't have foreign currency to make the necessary purchases, it can tap on the International Monetary Fund. So in essence, originally, the International Monetary Fund really was a fund, a fund of currencies which countries could use to adjust their exchange rate. Moreover, in order to prevent capital flight, it allows countries to impose capital controls. The second institutional pillar of the post-war Bretton Woods system was the World Bank, or the so-called International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It later morphed into the World Bank, which has several components, a number of different banks for different purposes. And that system should provide investments, money needed for the post-war recovery for economic development. The third pillar concerned trade. They thought that one should also act against the protectionism of the interwar years. And for that purpose, they came up with the GATT, with the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And this has the purpose of preventing protectionism by reducing tariffs, by reducing non-tariff barriers. What are non-tariff barriers? Well, they're different kinds. For example, regulation, which is protectionist. Yeah? You just make some product requirements which only your products meet and the foreign products normally don't meet. Well, that's uh, a relatively obvious trick and one can prevent that. Or another non-trade barrier are quantitative restrictions. You don't allow more than 
X number of products in or out of your country. And the GUT tries to prevent all that. Now, the problem is that an international trade organization never came into existence. The US Congress didn't want it, but GATT, the substantive core rules for international trade, were put into operation on a preliminary basis on which they stayed until 1994. Now let's take a closer look at the legal framework of the International Monetary Fund. There are five points that I think you should know. The first point is quotas. As I told you, the fund is in its original function really a fund of currencies. That means that members pay currencies, their own currencies or other convertible currencies into the fund according to their quota. Now the quota is determined as a function of their economic size and their population and their openness. It's a complicated formula. And uh, the crux is that the quota also determines the voting rights. So you, know, you, you see that it's not really an international organization where one state has one vote, but it's a fund where voting rights are divided or are distributed in accordance with the contribution to the fund. The second central pillar of the IMF up until about 1974 to 1976 was the system of fixed but adjustable exchange rates. That system had the US dollar as a lead currency. The value of the dollar was tied to gold at 35 US dollars per ounce. And the central banks of other members promised or were obliged to pack their currencies to the dollar within a adjustable band of plus or minus 1%. So once your exchange rate crossed that line, you had to intervene. The third pillar were prohibitions or asked still prohibitions on payment restrictions for current transactions. What are current transactions? Well, current transactions are financial transactions that correspond to trade. Whenever you make a purchase, you've got two transactions, the good and the payment. And current transactions are the payment. So that means that the IMF framework wanted to ensure trade-related payments without any inhibitions. In German, that is called Zahlungsverkehrskontrollen, and that is really not legal under the IMF legal framework up until this day. The fourth pillar is capital controls. Capital controls are payments for investments and investments are or can be prohibited and especially capital flight can be controlled. So one doesn't want the Great Depression to repeat itself. And the fifth pillar is the function of the IMF as a land of last resort for states. In case of payment difficulties, member states can draw on the fund's financial resources. They normally do so under a standby arrangement, which is a soft law agreement with the fund and which sets out the conditions under which the fund can lend them money. Now, this post-war system consisting of the IMF, of the World Bank and other regional investment banks or development banks and of the GUT enabled relatively stable conditions, at least for the developed countries, the industrialized economies. And it saw an enormous growth period. Domestically, that stabilized also the emerging welfare states. Now, you might know that the welfare state also already goes back to the 19th century, but it only became real and it only became what, we, what it is today after the Second World War. So, for example, healthcare only became universal in most countries after the Second World War. Even in the United States, systems like Medicaid and Medicare, they date from that period. In the, education also became a much bigger concern for the state. For example, tertiary education, universities were expanded in many uh, economies, in many countries. Social security was expanded, even though some schemes like uh, retirement uh, insurances date back from the 19th century. A right to work was not really established, 
but at least the, the right to strike was guaranteed. That was necessary in the context of the Cold War, where socialist states wanted to present them as you know, the better uh, version for workers. So the capitalist economies also had to make concessions to workers. And that meant that uh, the right to property was guaranteed, but nationalizations of private property were also a possibility. And in some cases, they actually occurred. Some countries had nationalized their industry in the post-war era before they privatized it again much later in the 1990s. But that was really a period where the state played a much more stronger intervening role in the economy in many respects. From a financial perspective, it is interesting to note that bank regulation was very strict at that point. For example, in the United States, the Glass-Steagall Act provided for the separation of investment and commercial banks. Banking regulation at the time wasn't, as we know, know it today, with um, capital requirements, but it rather consisted in restricting the activities of banks that related to their geographic reach or to the number of branches they could have or the kind of transactions they could carry out, like the Glass-Steagall Act. Altogether, this period of a strong state, a welfare state that was internationally protected by the Bretton Woods system, is called the so-called Trente Glorieuse. And now, for you to think, and perhaps for us to discuss in class, is the following. How glorious was this period for everyone? Was it great just for the industrial econo economies? What was the impact of that system on the non-industrialized developing economies? Think about it. That's all for today. I'm looking forward to see you face-to-face -face via Zoom in our class. Have a good week.